Welcome to episode 100 of Tech Sales Insights. I'm very excited and very honored to have uh, Carl Eschenbach, who's a longtime friend, amazing executive, and uh, super successful partner at Sequoia. Uh, Carl, welcome. Thank you, Randy, for having me. It's an honor to be here. I know we've been trying to get this on the calendar for quite some time. And uh, to be part of your uh, podcast here in episode 100, I, I just want to thank you for having me. That's all right. Ple pleasure's all ours for sure. And uh, th those watching along. Um, so our title topic is uh, Secret Sauce when it comes to leadership. Uh, we're sponsored by Gong, uh, which we will touch on uh, later on. But they're uh, certainly poised to be one of the leaders in the sales tech stack. They're sponsored sales community, revenue intelligence, and then now spanning across to kind of forecasting in some uh, other areas. And um, I, I was uh, joking the other day with uh, you know Chris Riley. It's, it's amazing all the stuff that we would do manually ourselves, you know, and now everything that's just, just, you know, kind of so automated, not, not that it's making life, you know, easy, but it's certainly easier, right, for uh, for, for CROs and as uh, sales leaders. Well, well said, Randy. You know, you know, I hate to you know showcase our age here, but when we were younger in sales leadership positions, the tools that uh, are available today, like Gong, we just didn't have. And you know, sales today is is as much data driven as it is science or you know art. Um, so I think, you know, these new sales tools like Gong are very valuable to, you know, anyone who wants to, you know, use them. It's, it's a different world for sure from when we grew up, right? Yeah. Amazing. I, I would say everybody's spoiled these days, right? Um, and, uh, you know, certainly you've been amazing for, you know, a lot of reasons, but the, the, the boards that you're on, I don't know how you do it. Zoom video, Snowflake, UiPath, Workday, Palo Alto, Cohesity, Aurora, Gongs, uh, Salt Security, Cresta, Grafana Labs, Armis, Thousand Eyes, and then mo most importantly, I'm sure, is your uh, uh, advisory board role with uh, with Sales Community, which uh, certainly thank you for that. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Randy, for uh, having me part of your Sales Community. And yeah, there are a lot of boards. Uh, it certainly keeps me busy on top of being responsible for investing here on behalf of Sequoia. Uh, but I enjoy it. I enjoy the diversity of the boards. I like having some public, some private. Uh, and I like the, uh, you know, the ability to be able to context switch from one type of company and technology to another on a pretty regular basis. There's days where I have sometimes two or even three board meetings in a day and I have to be able to context switch from one to the other. Just keep your mind very stimulated and keep it on your toes. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you're the, the most prepared out of a uh... Uh, everybody as well going into those. Um, so also too, so for those that are members of Sales Community, thanks. For those that are not, you can go to uh, salescommunity.com and you'll see a link in the upper left-hand corner that says uh, fall free. So you get a free year membership, lots of great content for those that want to uh, learn more and sell more and uh, certainly great networking opportunity. Uh, so as I said before, I think I've known Carl for probably over 20 years. We couldn't remember ex exactly when, but uh, certainly have uh, admired him uh, from afar. And then is always, uh, as I said before, just you know, crazy responsive uh, and really can't say enough great things about him as a human, as a, as a parent, certainly as a leader, and then now amazing VC and an investor. Uh, I guess Sequoia is probably getting big enough. Do you designate it as a, a VC or VC slash private equity? No, I, I don't think so. We are definitely a, a venture firm. Uh, yeah. Our objective here at Sequoia is to invest in companies from from the seed round to IPO and beyond. We have funds that span, you know, the early stage, the growth stage, and into the public markets. Uh, but we would definitely not classify ourselves as a private equity firm. We don't do buyouts, and our sole purpose in life is to find the outliers uh, who want to build enduring companies and invest in them from the early stage all the way through IPO and beyond. And, and that's our focus. Um, and, you know, it, Sequoia has been around now over 50 years and has a pretty good standing uh, in the community with both our portfolio companies, founders, but also amongst our peer group. Uh, but we're only as good as our last partnership for investment. Randy, just like in sales, you're only as good as your last yeah. 90 days. So we work hard to make sure we're out there finding the, the smartest, brightest entrepreneurs in the world, investing in them, and then helping them build their companies to endure over time. 
That's awesome. And uh, if it's okay to say, I think uh, a couple months ago when we were exchanging notes and I said, it's, you know, it was like a weekend, I think at night, I'm like, still, you know, if, if, you know, 90%, if whatever, half of the sales reps out there, or sales managers could be as responsive as you, you know, they'd be, you know, probably certainly selling a lot more, but you said uh, uh, closers and winners never sleep. So um, I, I thought that was good. So certainly. I, I haven't lost of- that edge. Uh, I keep that edge. Uh- awesome. So certainly appreciative for all your help and attention you've provided me over the years and probably really no reward for you. And then coincidentally, I think you're the originally the one that introduced me to uh, Amit at Gong and that, that's how that all got going. So uh, really interesting for sure. So yeah, uh, thank you for your help at Gong, Randy. They greatly appreciate your support. You can see they're sponsoring your podcast here today. Uh, but your insight, your experience, uh, and your track record of success has been impactful for them. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. And um, so for your for interest, I know, uh, you know, certainly family and work are a priority, but uh, you've always been a workout fiend and love sports and uh, golf as well. And then to uh, help with my extended intro here, <coughs> I've asked uh, a few friends to share some thoughts. Uh, Amit at uh, CEO of Gong does a great job, I think, summarizing you kind of overall. Carl is a legendary leader and investor. As a leader, he scaled VMware from 30 million or so to 7 billion unparalleled growth uh, trajectory. He's now partner of Sequoia, world's most prestigious uh, venture capital firm, board member and investor for some of the world's uh, best enterprise companies. Uh, Billy Scannell, president of Dell, uh, says uh, Carl's a great guy. Of course, Billy has to say he worked for me at EMC for a couple months. I think it was probably what a couple of weeks, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it was less than a month. Uh, yeah, but so of course, uh, it was it was a great life lesson to never burn bridges on your way out, even if it uh, was for a short period of time. And uh, Billy often laughs and says, uh, "I remember you said to me you were going to this company VMware," and Billy exactly. would always say, "What the hell is VMware? I, oh, you're yeah. crazy." <laughs> yeah. And then he says, yeah, boy, boy, was I wrong. And then uh, Bill continues. He became a partner in crime while I was at EMC. He was at VMware, incredible person, great family. Had the chance to meet his wife, son, twin girls in Austin two weeks ago for the Grand Prix. Polished executive, MBA at execution and a PhD as a dad and husband. I like that. Uh, he's a light that all moths flock to. Uh, if you don't like and respect a guy like Carl, you should look in the mirror, class A person all the way. Uh, Kevin Delane, uh, CRO at uh, Cohesity. Uh, we both kind of just uh, overlapped a bit in uh, uh, Costa Rica during their Presidents Club trip. Uh, so Kevin says Carl's attitude, energy, and integrity are extremely high. He brings people up anytime they speak to him. His knowledge of the technology market, sales execution, and leadership are the best I've witnessed in my career. Every sales and business leader in the world can learn from him. And uh, we're almost done here. Uh, B.J. Jenkins, uh, who was a uh, longtime Barracuda, now at uh, Palo Alto, Leg- says uh, Carl's a legendary sales leader who drove the creation of the virtualized compute category, admired and respected by all in the profession, and now leading venture uh, capital investor, board member, and coach for game-changing companies. Uh, he pushes himself every day to get better. His early morning gym sessions would put professional athletes to shame uh, and is a dear friend. So. Anyway, wow. so uh, that's very if kind. You're that's feeling down, if you're ever feeling down, you can just replay this. Yeah, Randy, uh, that's very kind, and thank you to all of them. I, I didn't expect that. Um, that's very kind and humbling for sure. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we should go on. We should just stop there and end your podcast. There you go. We're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, we want to encourage uh, any questions or comments as well as we go. Uh, So I'm sure you'll get some people chiming in. So Ken Groey says uh, VMware and EMC roots run deep. Uh, Dennis Cucullin says uh, love seeing two tech tech legends. So I'll jump on your coattails uh, on together and guys I worked with and learned so much from. So thanks, Ken and Dennis. So to uh, jump into uh, questions here, maybe uh, give us uh, briefly a bit about your professional background and uh, maybe start with your first job. Yeah. Wow. My first job takes me back to 1987, uh, Randy. When uh, when I came out of school, I joined a PBX company. Uh, probably some people on the call don't even know what the hell a PBX is, but a PBX was a phone system that uh, 
I was a, a pre-sales and field engineer implementing and installing PBX systems around the country for a company called Intercom uh, and installed phone systems in New York City uh, at Exxon building, McGraw Hill building at universities like Lehigh University at large enterprises like USAA, the insurance company. So I did that yeah. for many years. And then uh, I left and went into uh, a company called NET, which was a wide area networking company that did, uh, again, probably, uh, you know, terminology a lot of people might not remember, but, you know, TDM technology, frame relay, sonnet switching, wide area networking, and spent years there. I think I was there for probably six years, Randy. And uh, in my last year there, I did an interesting role. I was in the pre-sales. I was an SE for uh, you know five or six years. And then my last year there, they wanted to try this new role. Uh, and the role was called a, a sales engineer, where they wanted to take <laughs> a person and make them both a SE and a sales rep. So you were, in this case, being a male, I was a one-man band. And I was responsible for a number and all the technical attributes of selling the product. And I did that for a year and it was a, a super, uh, you know, uh, role. It was fun. And what I learned is I wanted to go all the way into sales. So then I moved into sales. And then shortly thereafter, I went from wide area networking, Randy, in the mid 90s to uh, local area networking and joined the forces at 3Com. Uh, and while at 3Com, I was in sales for a, a year or two, and then I was fortunate enough to get promoted uh, into my first sales leadership job at a quite a young age. A gentleman named Larry Costanza, who's my boss from back in Jersey, uh, promoted me, and I thank him for that to this day. And, and I spent many years there, and then a quick six-month stint, late 90s, at, a, you know, at Lucent Technology. And then uh, from there, I moved into my first pure play software company. Uh, it was called Ink to Me. Uh, Ink to Me was a content, you know, caching and network, you know, uh, content distribution business and a search engine business. And was there for, you know, three or four years. The company went public during the dot com days, Randy. It was, uh, I still think to this day, it was probably one of the fastest five rising stocks uh, during the dot com days. And it was also one of the fastest, uh, you know, five to come down the other side, too. Uh, but it was a hell of a journey and a lot of fun. And it was at that point, um, I was still living. I'm from Pennsylvania back east, Randy. I was still living back east. Uh, my wife had t just had a, a twins. And I was commuting to California uh, for ink to me. And we finally said, that's just not going to work. We got to make a change. And I was fortunate enough to run into a lot of your uh, your friends uh, and, and peers uh, at EMC because I was in New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, and I joined the likes of Kevin and Billy and team at EMC, uh, running uh, you know uh, the global accounts in New York City, and um, and it took me off the road from having to travel to California every week. So I was happy. My wife was happy. I'm not sure if my twin girls were happy. They were, you know, less than a year old, but it, it made the family happy. Um, and this is where it got a little bit uh, funny. Uh, looking back, I say funny, but the at time at the time, Randy, it was stressful. I think I was at EMC for three weeks, and I got introduced to this lady, Diane Green. Yeah, um, uh, and uh, she said, "I listen. We're we're building out a field organization. We have this product. We think we can take it to market." Uh, and I met her uh, through another colleague uh, that had just joined the company uh, as the head of sales, and he was going to bring me in to run the Americas. And I remember meeting Diane and saying to myself, if, if they can do what she says they're going to do, which I honestly question, this was like mainframe virtualization technology taken to open systems in the data center. Uh, if they can do that, I'm like, wow, they could change the landscape of computing in the data center forever. Uh, and I thought about it for a little bit. And then I, my biggest decision was how to tell my wife I'm going to work for a California based company again after three weeks. And then the second big thing was having to tell the, the great people at EMC at the time that I was going to leave. Um, to net it out, I was fortunate enough uh, to make, I believe, what was the right decision, join in 2002 in the early days of VMware. I think they had a couple hundred people. 
couple people and go to market and uh and off we went and it was an amazing 14 and a half year journey um at the mware uh you know, I did all, just about every role except for the CEO role, including uh, I was a CFO for a few quarters while we were absent a CFO. I had to do that as a public company. Um, so it was a great experience. But then it was time to be back home, Randy, and be with the family again as the children were now three kids all going into high school. So I got fortunate opportunity to join Sequoia. Um and I've been here six and a half years, and it's been a great experience. I've learned how to be an investor. I think I'm a better executive. I'm much more detailed on how to operate and run a company here. And I, uh, you know, being at a venture firm like Sequoia, and I'm biased. I think there's only one venture firm out there, and that is Sequoia. And it's a, it's. Of course, though, I, is there anybody else? I don't know. There's plenty of them, but uh, I Amity, feel blessed. Peter, to be Peter here. Bell would say Amity Ventures. I got it. Yeah, Peter. Keep, Peter does really keep, well, keep, but uh, Peter it keeps you young being at a venture firm because you're looking at leading technology all the time, and and that takes me to where I'm at here today, six and a half years later. It's been a great journey. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, generally speaking, I'll say you know you and Peter are kind of the minority when it comes to operators at VC firms. So I don't know what the number is, but my guess would be most. Uh, people or most partners have not really had operating jobs previously. Is that the case or no? Yeah, I think um, certainly there, there are some people even here at Sequoia who had operating roles in the past, but typically they come through the product side or the finance yeah. side, uh, you know, yeah. uh, but most people at venture firms, you know, grow up as investors, work in investment banking, work at private equity. I say I'm, you know, not that I'm the outcast. I don't like being the outcast, but I, I don't think typically that you see someone who comes up through sales and marketing and operations necessarily join the ranks of the venture community. And again, I'm thankful for Sequoia for, uh, you know, taking a, a chance uh, to bring me in with no background, probably uh, that fit their model, but it's worked for all of us. It's been a great uh, opportunity for both parties. Yeah, well, I'm sure you get your fingernails dirty and, you know, add value as opposed to not that others pontificate, but certainly in your, your operating shoes and what you did and how, how you did, I'm sure brings huge value. So um, so you look at new deals as well as helping current companies, correct? Yeah, I am, uh, you know, I'm responsible for investments. Uh, and I obviously, with my 30 years of operating background, hopefully bring a tremendous value to our portfolio and our company. So I probably spend the majority of my time doing more operational work with our companies, yeah. but I also have a very big responsibility to make investments and drive returns for our limited partners. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it depends. Every day is different. Today is a day where I have a couple board meetings and a call with you. Uh, and then, you know, uh, tomorrow I'm seeing two or three net new companies. So uh, every day is slightly different, but it's a combination of investing. Uh, I'm, you know, I help with leadership inside the partnership. Uh, and then, uh, you know, working with our portfolio companies to help them build, grow and scale. That's great. So um, I, I'm sure there's Sequoia has, you know, long profile criteria for winning companies, but kind of what do you find if there's a, you know, kind of three things that kind of separates kind of company that you choose to invest in versus ones that you take a pass on? Yeah, that's a great company. And I think there are some, if you will, uh, there's some commonality about how we look at companies uh, to, and decide to make investments. But then I also think each individual partner has their own way of coming up with their own belief of whether or not we should invest in a company. For me, I look at it two different dimensions. First, what is inside the building? Meaning learning about the founder, the entrepreneur, their ability to recruit, grow and scale, to identify with their own weaknesses, because as a founder, you got to bring in a team to surround you and you know amplify your weaknesses, but also support your strengths. So I really focus on that founder and their ability uh, to recruit people uh, in a team, whether or not they have experience in whatever it is, the domain or area that they're, you know, going into. Um, what is their background? Uh, you know, I go all the way back to their childhood. As you know, Randy, you know, there's certain things you can hire for, but you can't hire for passion and drive. 
Uh, so I like to find out about the person. So I start inside the building first, or if it's a really young company, it might not be inside the building because there's no building, but you have to find out about them as a person. And then I look at what's happening outside the building. There's two different types of companies uh, that you can invest in. One, what we call category creation companies, companies that go out and create a new category, build a big company and overnight uh, become a market leader of a big segment that they help create. An example would be, you know, virtualization, what Diane and uh, her team did uh, at VMware. We were fortunate to become a category creator and then a category king. The second type of company is a company that is going after a market that has a large TAM, but that has lacked innovation for years and it's ripe for disruption. Uh, a company you mentioned earlier where Kevin Delane's at, Cohesity, right? The, the, the backup market, the data recovery, the data protection market has existed a long time, but hasn't seen as much innovation yeah. in the last 10 years or so. And someone like Cohesity comes and disrupts that market with a new solution around data management. So I look at whether the company is going to create a category company uh, type of company. That's hard, really hard. Or are they going to disrupt an existing market? And both can be successful. So we look inside and outside the building is one way to think about how we look at new investments. And I didn't get into all the metrics and how we dive deep into all that stuff. But as you could imagine, um, we go pretty deep looking at the financials of the company, especially on the growth team where they have numbers. You can see how the business is uh, functioning uh, and how well they're driving growth. Great. And then speaking of co Cohesity, I just think in small world. So I think you got introduced to them through me because I was on the whatever, advisory board with Mohit and then had uh, met with Gaurav and Bill. And that was when you're at VMware well before uh you're at uh, Sequoia and I think connect the dots and we're doing so there's some time there for Veeam. I forgot what it was, but then introduced you. And then that led to, I think you being, being on the board and being involved. So small world yeah. for sure. Yeah, it was <laughs> one of the, once I joined Sequoia, uh, it was one of the first companies that I got engaged with and started to work with, uh, you know, for the last now for almost six years, it's been a fun journey. Yeah. And you have a uh, Sanjay now from uh, VMware as a CEO, correct? Yeah, we brought Sanjay in uh, three months ago, um, and uh, he came in as CEO, and Mo had stepped into uh, running all product uh, and engineering, which is where he's amazing at. He's one of the smartest founders yeah. I've had the opportunity to work with. And now we bring Sanjay in, who's really good at driving sales and marketing. I think between the two of them, we have a, a great set of leaders in the company, and then you back it up with the rest of the team, including Kevin and folks. Yeah, that's great. So um, now maybe talking about how you help current companies, I'm sure there's kind of a laundry list, but kind of, um, you know, any kind of, you know, maybe uh, one or two examples that you can give. And I don't know if you can mention the company or not. Yeah, well, I hope uh, if you ask my companies that I get to work with, they'll have lots of answers here. I think, you know, sure. obviously having, uh, you know, uh, you know, almost three full decades of operating experience. I just bring them, uh, you know, insights and thoughts about things they probably haven't thought of. You know, we often like to say we can help them see around corners uh, where things might be coming that yeah. they, they're not aware of. Um, I spend a lot of time hopefully mentoring both CEOs and the leaders of the company. I'm quite active in recruiting in helping build out the leadership or management team in the company. Uh, I'm quite active in building out the boards and helping get the right board of directors around the company to help you know them uh, you know uh, get influence from outside uh, directors. And then you know I'd say lastly, my Rolodex with customers has remained uh, relatively fresh over the years. Yeah. And, <laughs> I, uh, and an area I love to spend time is I am. You know, pretty damn active with all of the companies uh, and helping them drive sales and, and close business and build relationships and make those introductions. So uh, hopefully there's a whole bunch of things. And then, you know, now I've been very blessed to be part of uh, maybe five, six, seven IPOs. So going through the IPO process from taking a company from the private market into the public market is not an easy task. Um, and having been through that many times, hopefully it can be uh, quite beneficial for companies that are ready for that stage. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, before I get into some of these leadership topics, we have some questions I'll try and uh, buzz through. So uh, Jesse asks, uh, Carl, will you be paying $8 for the uh, blue check on Twitter? You know, I probably won't. Um, I, I am not uh, the biggest Twitter user uh, myself. I follow it and some of my younger partners are extremely vibrant on yeah. it and I watch them and I, I get my enjoyment through them. But personally, I probably won't. Uh, and I don't know if that's an age demographic thing or what, but I, uh, I, I watch it, I listen to it, but I can't say I'm out there tweeting too often, but my partners in Sequoia is very active and does a great job on it. There you go. We had a, early on, we we're doing these podcasts, we were doing them on uh, Twitter and we spend like half the time, you know, just trying to get like Casale or McKay, just trying to get them on Twitter. And then how do they use it? And finally, we said, okay, this is like, we can't do that. It just, it just, it just doesn't work. It's like, you know, trying to get some of the people, I think Clubhouse was more West Coast centric. We also tried that. And half the time people would spend, you know, the time just, okay, just, how do I use this? And what is it? I'm like, okay, we're just do, uh, just do LinkedIn live. Um, and then Jesse, <laughs> Then Jesse says, great show. I uh, love this every week. Thank you. Uh, Dan Carroll says, Randy, thanks for the show. Uh, Ted Wallace uh, says, uh, we see change management as a major driver in successful sales and marketing technology implementations. Absolutely. Uh, what tips from a leadership perspective could you give us for effective change management? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And especially as we sit here in the current, you know, times we're in, Randy. Uh, you know, I often say to people, wishful thinking is a waste of time. Don't sit around and think about the good old days, but really focus on the future and drive change because change management is probably the only thing that's constant right now. And what's really interesting, if you think about change and you study anything around change management, about 60% of the people sit back and watch and literally, you know, do, do nothing. 20% of the people fight change management. And yeah. the other 20 go and get shit done. Um, yeah. You want to be part of that other 20% that's getting things done and driving change management. Because in the climate we're in today and potentially even broader headwinds going forward, if your company, right, is not changing as fast as what's happening outside the walls of your company, death is near. Um, and you just got to be open to change. You have to communicate change as a leader right now, more than ever, open communication is critical. You need to be clear. You need to be concise. You need to do it with a sense of confidence. Uh, and you also need to do it with calmness because your voice as a leader, especially during times of change, you need to think about having a megaphone in front of your mouth. You think, you know, you're saying one thing, but it's being amplified. People hold on to every single word you have to say during these times. And you just need to be uh, aware of it. The other thing is, I think you have to have this to drive change. You have to have this sense or feeling of optimism, but also be a realist. Yeah. And you can't over rotate one way or the other. Um, but people do look for leaders right now and, and, and they're holding on to what you're saying. They're leaning on you, looking for advice. Um, it's a challenging time. And I think this is when the greatest leaders are born and come out the other side are during times like we're in right now. Oh, yeah. I, I don't, I'll, I'll make an example, but say if um, Billy at Dell is working with Gong, right? He's got to set the example to say, hey, this is a new, different, better motion that we're going to do. And then you need to have the leaders. I'm going to forget a bunch of people, but say a, a, a Doherty, a, a Kevin Connolly, Dan Zugelder, you know, others kind of then kind of embrace it and then have some of probably the best reps step up and also embrace it to say, OK, hey, this is kind of what we're doing and here's how we're doing it. And you got to kind of get you really kind of get on the train or, or get off the train, right? For like, for like a better word. So yeah. uh, great answer. Thanks. Uh, and then who do you have here? Uh, Dan Carroll, uh, Carl, what advice from an operational standpoint are you giving founders, CEOs in today's uh, markets at board meetings? Great question, Dan. Yeah, again, this is, you know, all about leaning in uncertain times and how to go about it. And, and let me be very clear, folks, I don't have all the answers. 
I've been through, you know, a number of market downturns. As you could tell, starting my career in 87, I've seen it, you know, just about everyone in the last now 30 years. Uh, but there are certain things I think you can do. I talked about, you know, that communications, the style of communications has to be delivered with conviction, with confidence, right? But also calmness. Uh, I think it's super important that leaders today don't overreact, uh, don't make you know rash decisions, uh, and don't uh, let the company or your team know uh, that you're fearful of the situation that's in front of you. A couple other things that uh, I talk to everyone about right now. Focus. Right now is a time to focus. And the way you focus is on by uh, what I describe as keeping things simple, Randy. One of the sayings I have is, Simplicity scales, complexity doesn't. And I think yeah. what's happened over the last few years, complexity has creeped into the operating model because how many people we've hired, how many different project people have started, how horizontal we've gone right across the operating model. And I think we've lost a little bit of operational rigor. And I think it's time to get back to simplicity because simplicity scales, complexity doesn't. The other thing I'd say and this is, you know, both a business uh, comment, Randy, as well as a sales comment. Uh, in a market like this, it is time to reevaluate your value proposition. Because, Randy, you know this as well as anyone. I think people buy for one of three reasons. Number one, people talk about all strategic selling, solution selling, you know, all of these different frameworks out there. But what I have learned, the greatest sales value proposition of all time is a strong ROI. Yep. And in down markets, nothing sells like a strong ROI. So I encourage people to revisit their value proposition, number one, around ROI. The second reason people buy is if you're going to help them drive revenue growth. And if you can have a value proposition that shows tangible evidence of it and you can back it up with quantifiable numbers, uh, people will buy your technology. And the third reason people buy is to reduce risk. Now, the reduced risk is for people selling in the, if you will, the security market. It's a lot harder than having a strong ROI or showing how you'll drive revenue. But even in a reducing risk environment, you start to really think about how you protect your most precious assets of the company and what happens should you have a security breach or something like that. There is an ROI impact then. So, um, you know, I would focus on value proposition more than ever. And then the last thing I'd say, you know, during these times, I think you really got to double click on how hard you're scrubbing your pipeline more than ever. Because in times of uncertainty, Sales reps, sales leaders, sales teams reach for anything that sounds like an opportunity. They qualify yep. things out more than they qualify things in. So I think being really open with your teams about the importance of qualifying, time is precious during you know a, a moment like this. We should be focusing on those opportunities that are real quality. Uh, and have an opportunity to come out the other end of the funnel and close into a sale. So cleaning up that funnel, not expanding it because people grasp for anything. They get those kind of elephant ears. Everything sounds like an opportunity when in fact, right now it's a lot harder to sell. Absolutely. And, then, and I'd put a kind of a icing on the cake, which I'm sure you're violent agreement with, but just kind of just, you know, sales 101. I do a uh, weekly LinkedIn post. I might be old school, but uh, but I can't tell you how many examples of things, just people not kind of stupid stuff, right? doing, doing the follow-up. Okay, what's the agenda for the call? What's the executive update? Kind of how are you plugging everything in? How are you connecting the dots? What is that value prop? It's just, you know, it's sort of this, some, anyway, it's just, you know, it's almost like a, a, a lost art. Uh, sorry, I guess I got a little banging right there. Uh, and then, uh, ba, 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 I am losing my spot here. Ken Grovey said, always make uh, news, don't report the news. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Okay. And then, uh, sorry, so John Cotter, uh, thanks for being your uh, criteria for founders and companies to invest in. How about from a sales perspective evaluating series AB companies to join? And Mike, we're going to be running out of time. So if I could ask, maybe just kind of, uh, your answers are fantastic, but maybe just a bit briefer. 
Uh, and this is specific to series, you know, A or B or C. Yeah, a, 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 B, a, B companies in this case. Yeah. Listen, it's, it, you know, and sometimes in series A, Randy, um, they don't have a sales team. Uh, they're still trying to find product market fit. So I think, you know, in series A, a lot of it is helping them find that first sales leader. Series B, once they have product market fit in a sense of repeatability, uh, we spend time helping them recruit that first sales leader. Uh, I think, you know, that's something we do uh, very well here at Sequoia because of our deep network. Um, but we help them across every stage of growth. We actually have this whole way to show people to grow a sales organization that we can take offline from a series A to scaling it up to billions of dollars. We have a framework for that. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. You're, uh, yeah, you're, yeah. The, I'll say that I call it a cookbook, but kind of the playbooks certainly are, uh, uh, are legendary for sure. Um, then, uh, Ted Grossman, uh, I know you're familiar with the Alexander group. I am. So they're, uh, you know, fantastic. Actually just did a, uh, invite only CRO webinar with them, uh, earlier that went over really well, but they're, uh, uh, fantastic group. So he says, uh, Ted says, uh, Carl in the last several years, uh, you see titles like CRO, CCO, are you a believer in cross-functional go-to-market leaders, or do you like more of single focus management? And I'll add on there specifically, do you think a CMO and CRO function should be separate or uh, on one under another? Um, I, I don't think it's a one size fits all answer. Um, I believe at a certain scale, you can have a CRO uh, a title. Um, it's funny, I was on a board meeting call today, they're gonna hire a CRO. And the first thing I asked the CEO, is what functions will the CRO have responsibility for? Because they're going to have the CRO term, in my opinion, is super overused. Uh, right. You know, does it own customer success? Does it own support? Does it own pre-sales? Does it own marketing? Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that can be included in that or not. I will tell you what gets put under the CRO title depends on the CRO. Yep. I know CROs who have the responsibility for everything that is customer facing. Uh, and then I know CROs who basically run the sales function. I don't think it's one size fits all. Yeah, totally. And uh, by, by the way, I don't know if you know, actually I have a uh, recruiting business. I'm sure you use all these you know, fancy uh, re retained firms, but uh, we can do a good job for you as well. If somebody wants good, good, great, great people and good, good value. So. Um, anyway, um, moving on, uh, Ken Doherty, uh, great sales leader, uh, Dell says, uh, this discussion podcast spectacular, uh, Carl, you mentioned two approaches when investing, uh, one startups that create a, a new market opportunity and two companies that have disruptive technology in the existing market with the large TAMs in today's macroeconomic climate, do you have a preference? Uh, no, I, I don't have a preference, to be honest. In fact, some of the greatest companies uh, in technology started during down markets. Uh, you know, when you start a company, um, it takes many years. There's very few flash in the pans that emerge in one or two years and have hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, I don't think one or the other uh, is correlated to the current market environment we're in because both will take a while. Even if you're going to go disrupt an existing market, Randy, it takes a while to build the technology, build the team, and find a repeatable sales process in motion. So I don't think uh, we're open to both. And it also, to be honest, it depends on what stage you're investing. If it's a seed or an early stage company, it's an idea. Uh, if it's a growth company, you'll know what type of market they're going out to either build, uh, you know, create or disrupt. So I don't think... Uh, the current market uh, conditions uh, sway us to focus on one area or the, or another. Yeah, and I, I would imagine Sequoia takes a much longer term view. So not that the current environment doesn't matter, but you know, you, you're kind of playing for, as you said, several years, it could be five, 10 years down the road, not necessarily now, correct? Exactly. Uh, what we know about cycles is they go up and down. And, you know, even if we're in a down market, it will go up again at some point. And we're here to weather the storm with our companies uh, and get them to the other side. That's why we focus. One of our key sayings is helping people build enduring businesses that will stand the test of time. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we have from Brian Gregory, great discussion. Trust always matters with the customer. And as uh, Ken Doherty and others, I don't know if you ever knew Walter Brown, but he was early on consultant at EMC. And uh, one of his several sayings were, uh, know me, like me, trust me. Uh, and then Carl says, great conversation. Thanks, Randy and Carl. So I'm going to try and get to at least one of the several questions that uh, <laughs> we prepared ahead of time. Uh, maybe talk about um, the ideas kind of secret sauce when it comes to leadership. So maybe uh, focus specifically kind of from a CRO perspective, uh, top of mind thoughts there. Well, secret it doesn't necessarily have to be C CRO, sorry, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily need to be CRO because, you know, generally speaking, you know, le leadership is leadership. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that leadership spans all functions or roles uh, or organizations that you're leading. I mean, um, and it, it's an area that I am very passionate about, Randy. I could talk you know, for about 100 hours on leadership, uh, speaking of episode 100. Um, but I'll just throw out the things that are at least important to me that I try to mimic as best I can. And again, I don't have all the answers. So the first key thing to successful leaders, they are typically very humble and grounded, and they all remember where they came from. I always tell people, as you get promoted, you're getting promoted typically in your career because of who you are. It doesn't mean when you get that next job, you need to change who you are. Continue being you who you are, but the key things are to remain humble and grounded in all you do. I also think great leaders are authentic, and they are not afraid to be vulnerable. Saying I don't know is sometimes the greatest answer of all. Absolutely. And no one has all the answers. But I also know no one wants to work with someone or for someone who believes they have all the answers, right? Uh, I think, you know, it's just, it's not fun and people see right through it. I also think I, what I say, Randy, is E and E are contagious. And people say, what is E and E? Well, it's energy and enthusiasm, especially as a sales leader. If they're energetic and they have enthusiasm, you've seen it, Randy. You walk into a room, a conference room, you're at a sales kickoff conference. You know when that person has energy and they're enthusiastic, it just permeates the rest of the organization. And as a leader, we talked about earlier, people are watching you, right? So if you don't have that, like, I just think it's a, it's a lost art and trait. And you can't teach that. That's just how people right. are. Um, and then just because we're short on time, uh, I think there's three types of leaders. Uh, and for those people who maybe heard me speak about this in the past, you'll recognize it. I think there's first type of leader out there is the motivational leader. And we all probably like working for a motivational leader. But if you stop and just think about what a motivational leader does, he or she pushes people. Motivation is a push technique. And that's great because that's how you get the best of your people. You need to push them. You need to drive them. And we all have a motivational button in our body at some point. The leader's responsibility is to figure out what that is and push it. At the same time, Randy... There's another type of leadership that I personally think can be or is more powerful, and that's the inspirational leader. And the reason I say that, if you think about an inspirational leader, it's not a push technique, it's a pull technique. They draw people into them. They draw them into their mission, their objective, their strategy, and then that team doesn't want to let her or him down. That's an inspirational leader. And then the third level of leadership is the one who knows how to do both. Because there are times, Randy, when you needed to be pushed probably and get that little extra out of Randy. But then there's other times people inspired you and pulled you in. So the leaders who can do both you know, motivational leader and inspirational leaders simultaneously and figure out the experiences when to use which one, I think end up being the best leaders out there on the planet. Absolutely. And then um, I'm not sure if it's a different level or cascades across all of them, but I know something we're both uh, big believers in is uh, kind of leading by example as well. I mean, there's so many times I think you have leaders that do what you just said, but 
they call like, oh, yeah the reps not doing this reps not doing that well what are you doing to actually show them what are you doing to then reach out to that prospect to be on that call to do the follow-up to work with whatever the executive is above them to say okay here's how we're going to handle that objective here's how we're going to push for lack of better words to get the deal done showing the value and everything else and then kind of recap that for your org to say look here's a situation I'm not going to throw so and so under the bus take it as learning opportunity but that's something with that leading by example area that today i just see lacking yeah i it's well said another way to describe those people are do the dishes leader is the leader when yeah. they walk into the break room or the kitchen willing to go and you know clean the dishes that are in the sink uh, they should be now yeah. let me also then a little bit um speak out of the other side of my mouth or contradict what we both just said I think there's another type of leadership out there everyone talks about, but I don't think it's well understood and we won't get into the details. I'll give it a very surface level, uh, you know, um, discussion here is everyone says they want to be or they try to be a servant leader. And if you asked everyone on this call what servant leadership means, I will tell you, you'll get a different answer from almost everyone. But if yeah. you go and study what true servant leadership is, Think about the very first word of servant leadership, and that is to serve. And I fundamentally believe the greatest leaders, regardless of role or capacity, are the ones that serve their people. Yep. They're not leading them. And through that servant type approach, your leadership gets displayed and everyone becomes more successful. Absolutely. A amen for sure. I call it the kind of rever reverse pyramid, uh, which usually people have a hard time de dealing with. So all right, I'm going to try and... <laughs> I'm trying to uh, uh, two quick questions here. Actually, I, I have to chime in if it's okay. Ken, uh, who I respect immensely, best leaders action oriented. No better example action oriented leadership than Randy. Appreciate that. And you know, Carl, amazing example. So, um, uh, second to last question, uh, Carl, what book are you reading now? You know, to be honest, I'm not a big reader. Uh, you know, but uh, there's a couple books that are on my nightstand that are always there. Uh, one uh, is is called Halftime uh, by Bob Buford, um, which is a super uh, powerful book for people trying to understand the importance of their own life and how to shift their life from a life of success, which we all had at one point, to a life of significance. And I will tell you as a leader, when you move from focusing on success in your own success to focusing on significance and being a servant leader and how you impact others, your success goes up dramatically. And then the other book that is on my nightstand is actually a book, Randy, written by my sister called Abound. And it is very specifically, uh, you know, um, about servant leadership. Uh, it's a really interesting book that my sister wrote. Uh, that I uh, always keep next to my nightstand to remind me of who I am, where I came from, and how I should act as a leader. Wow, awesome. And I'll, I'll put in a shameless plug. You're kind enough to give me a testimonial for uh, your, your go-to sales advisor. So thank you. Lots of, uh, of great of folks. Ken Doherty, Ken Groey, uh, Chris Riley, others participated. So maybe a uh, last question. Um, any uh, PG Randy story that you have? Uh, I have lots of stories, but I'm not sure they're PG, Randy. Um, so, uh, sorry, I can't give any, uh, any PG. I'm being facetious. Listen, I don't have any PG stories. The one thing I've always appreciated about you, Randy, and this wasn't, you didn't ask me to say this or you didn't give me any warning on any of this stuff. So I appreciate that. I'd rather do things on the fly. I just appreciate your leadership over the, the years. Um, but something I appreciate probably more than that is just your commitment and loyalty to your family, uh, to your children and being there for their sporting events and finding a time to live that balanced life uh, between your professional career and all the success you had and making sure that the family is uh, first and foremost uh, top of mind for you. I think that's something that's really hard for people to do uh, when they find success. Uh, and it's super important to find uh, that balance Actually, Randy, in your living proof of this, I think, you know, people say work-life balance. I think it's really hard because it does get out of balance. It's impossible not to. I think if you focus on the word harmony, how do you have work-life family harmony? 
then it all works together as one. And sometimes it gets in balance and sometimes it's out of balance, but it's harmonized to give you a great life, both personally and professionally. And I think I've seen you do that nicely. Great. Thank you very much. It uh, mean, means a lot uh, for, for sure. Uh, and actually I have, uh, it didn't quite come up, but uh, Janet just re redecorated my uh, office down here. So we got Tommy's uh, Alabama banner and then uh, Billy's White Sox banner. So, and I, and I try and cover, I, try, I, I, I have my BC, but I try my best to cover my, uh, try and cover Janet's Notre Dame. <laughs> she uh, snuck that one in there on me. So, um, all right, so you've been fantastic. Uh, Harlan says, roll tide, go White Sox, go Eagles. Uh, Dan, thanks. So, uh, Carl, uh, everybody watching, thank you so much. Um, Gong, fantastic uh, uh, revenue intelligence platform. I think will evolve to be one of the uh, bigger, better uh, sales tech stack leaders, certainly over time. Uh, Carl, uh, amazing partner at Sequoia. Thank you so much for your amazing insights. Uh, hopefully we can get you back here as well. And uh, for those that are not members of sales community, you can join salescommunity.com. And for those that are, thank you very much. And uh, this gets... Uh, rebroadcast by Tucker uh, all over the social mediums. And uh, Tucker, uh, thanks for your help uh, beneath or uh, behind the scenes here. So uh, Carl, thanks so much. Have a great one. Randy, thank you. And thank you for all you're doing for the sales community out there, including Gone.